Welcome everyone. I'm Ashley Rolf, the Content Marketing Lead with Perfection Learning. We're excited to have you join us for this evening's webinar, Let Them Read, Free Choice Reading for Engagement and Academic Success. Before we begin, I would like to mention a few housekeeping items. Please direct all comments and questions to the chat, which we will monitor throughout the discussion. You can ex access the chat through the button in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Using the chat now, please let us know where you're joining from tonight. We also want to let you know that you will receive an email tomorrow with a link to a recording of this webinar, the presentation slide deck, and some additional resources, so please be on the lookout for that. Before we begin our discussion, I am honored to introduce you to our presenter this evening. Michael Guevara is a former high school journalism and English teacher who spent his time in the classroom helping students see themselves as writers and fall in love with reading through the world of young adult literature. As an educational sales consultant with Perfection Learning, Michael works with teachers and schools to improve their literacy instruction and provide resources to help students achieve academic success. He has taught elementary school, middle school, and high school, has worked as a district level leader, and served on the Texas State Standards Revision Committee that helped develop the state's current literacy standards. Michael is working on a professional development book for literacy educators and currently has agents reading the manuscript of his young adult novel, The Closest Thing to a Normal Life. Michael, I'm going to pass the presentation off to you. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here and that you have chosen to spend your evening with us in such a um, such a busy time of year. So thank you again for that. This has really been kind of a a journey and a process that started, you know, a number of years ago uh, when I was first teaching and probably in my second year of teaching and came across two different articles and I think they were in English Journal you know, back in the day. And one of them was essentially about what college and university professors expect students to be able to do when um, with any piece of text um, by the time they get to them. And then the other was about uh, not so much, they didn't matter so much what students read, but that they read. And so that was kind of informing my thinking, although I was still following that pattern that, you know, traditional English teacher, we're going to read this set of novels at this grade level. And, and that's what, um, and that's what we did. And that's kind of the process I operated under for quite some time. Um, and then, you know, as I was making that shift and I was doing independent free choice reading, but again, like lots of English teachers, it was either if we happen to have time, if, you know, it was kind of a second afterthought. It wasn't at the forefront of what we were doing, which is kind of funny because we as English teachers love reading so much and yet we get so busy with all the things that we have to do. And so then I was... Oh, let's see, my screen is not advancing. Um, there we go. So my middle son, who I don't know that he fits the definition of middle child, but, um, you know, has always been, um, wasn't always a reader, but somewhere around, you know, we grew up reading to him, but somewhere just did not like reading. And then in fourth grade, he had a teacher who was a huge Harry Potter fan. And so he started reading all of the Harry Potter books. And by the time he, you know, finished fourth grade, he had read all of the books in the series and then moved to the Chronicle of Nardia. And so he was reading, loved reading. So, you know, we move on to high school. He's a junior in high school at this time. And we were moving into a new house. And so we were moving things from our storage unit from a large storage unit to a small storage unit. And so there's just the last few little things remaining and just little odds and ends. And I'm there with Zane. And all of a sudden I see something fly across the room, hit the wall and fall to the ground. And I walk over and I look and he has chunked a copy of Great Expectations at the wall. And I looked at him and he looked at me and he said, I hated that book. And I knew that they spent 312 weeks in class on that book. And that, that is just too long for students to not be engaged in what they're reading. So I was, was really thinking about my classroom and the, and the time that we spent on those books and um, how students were not engaged. And it, um, it kind of reminded me of this excerpt I ran into from Kwame Alexander's book, 
where he says, Mrs. Hardwick's honors English class is one boring required read after another. So you become a pro at daydreaming while pretend listening. And I thought so many of our students are doing that. Um, and yet we continue with the same pattern. That's what um, that's what Joan Kinding talks about in, we're not advancing again. Let's try that again. I can do it from here. So uh, Joan Kinding in her book, Choosing to Read, uh, Connecting Middle Schoolers to Books, uh, talks about this idea that um, what we know about, oh, my screen is in the way here. Um, what we know about the way children read and the read have this infrastructure from how we taught reading in schools, the approach of choosing books from an outdated, archaic canon of classics is just firmly entrenched. And then talks about how those books were written for adult readers with leisure time. So as a result, we have classrooms full of disengaged readers who do everything they can not to read the boring books that we force upon them. Um, and yet we continue this same practice year after year. So kids aren't seeing themselves represented in the books that we are choosing for them. And on top of that, they're not seeing themselves represented by the teachers who are in their classroom. Overwhelmingly, um, our student population is racially and ethnically diverse, but our teaching population isn't. And so how do we bridge that gap between students seeing themselves reflected in text, but then also making that a part of our classroom instruction. So we know, so Penny Kittle and her, and her uh, book, book Love, Developing Depth, Stamina, and Passion in Adolescent Readers, says that the way that we move students from non-committed to passionate readers is with the right books, time to read, and regular responses to their thinking. And I have to tell you that I was very fortunate to receive one of the Book Love Foundation grants that gave me money to purchase classroom, um, to put, purchase books for my classroom library. And we're gonna talk about that later and kind of this idea about books and how we get books, but we know that we want kids reading. We also know that students read 50 to 60% more in classrooms with adequate classroom libraries. And that we know that the single uh, the single factor most strongly associated with reading achievement, more than socioeconomic status or any instructional approach, is independent reading. Uh, and so we're speaking to that idea of how do we get that and how do we make that happen um, in our classrooms. And so we were able to do that. We were very fortunate. I was, you know, developed this kind of plan that I've been using in my classroom and kind of the local paper took note of that and they came to our classroom and watched, um, watched what we did with uh, independent reading and how students were so engaged in the books that they were choosing. And so it was really nice um, little feature that they had about us. They went and later fixed the headline in the online version where they had a little typo, but um, uh, but it's really what, what became the core instructional practice of uh, my classroom. And so and I found it was so important because Juan, who's a sophomore in my English class, and he comes up to me one day and he says, sir, I finished my book. I've never finished a book before in my life. And this is a kid's a sophomore in high school. He says, I've never finished a book in his life. I'm like, okay, that's great. Okay, let's pick. And I wish I could remember what book it was. But he's like, Let, let's let's pick your next book. Where, where are we going from here? And, and um, one of his friends, a fellow soccer player, chimes in and says, read The Living. That's a badass book. This is a book by Matt Delapena. It's a two book series. And so, um, and I've never heard that kind of endorsement or to Kill a Mockingbird, Great, ex great Expectations, any of those kind of classics that we were always reading in class. And so, um, so Juan starts reading uh, The Living. He's about halfway, he's about halfway through that book. And he says, oh my gosh, this is so good. The same student chimes in and says, wait till you get to The Hunted. Shit goes down. That's the kind of passion that we want from our students because whether we want to realize it or not, this is um, from um, uh, this latest study from Richard Marr and to a psychology professor at the York University in Canada. Says when it comes to reading, it really is a case in which the rich get richer. Research showing that the those who tend to get better at reading find it uh, read more, and they get better at reading, they find it easier and more enjoyable. And so we know that kids get better at reading by reading, by reading more. And the way we get them to read more is for them to have access to books they can and want to read. And we know that 
all that other stuff, our tests, whether it's English language arts, social studies, or math, all those state assessments, those things, they're all reading tests. And so the better kids read, the better they're going to do on those tests. So how do we make that happen? Because I've had lots of teachers tell me, I'd love to do that. I'd love to have all of my kids reading the book that they want to read, but I've got 30 kids in this class. I've got 35 kids in this class. I, I haven't read all the books they've read. How, how can we do that? And so that's kind of the system we're going to go through um, this evening. It's kind of uh, starts with my dog here with uh, Zeke, who most of the time drives me crazy, but, you know, we still love him. And so um, so this grew to that article that I read years ago about um, what university and college professors expect students to be able to do when they when they get to them. And so like typical English teacher fashion, I, I took that article and I created this acronym out of it. And so what happens is my students got a copy of this that they kept a kind of half sheet page that they kept in their literacy notebooks and then on color paper, we laminated bookmark sizes that the kids have. So they had the bookmark version that they kept in their independent um, reading books and they kept those with them. And so um, we're gonna walk through that process. I did wanna show you that I also have a modified version for younger readers or for students who um, have uh, other needs. And so, and we're not gonna go over this one, but it's really self-explanatory if you, um, once we get um, through this one, they essentially follow the same, uh, the same pattern. So we're just going to jump right into this. I hope that you have um, something to um, write with. Ashley's going to put into the chat. Um, I start. We just started off with regular computer paper that folded to create these squares. I think it's three folds. So you'll you'll um, you'll figure it out. But uh, it started off on paper and then eventually moved to a Google Doc. I made it much easier to read, but walked kids through this process. And so uh, so you'll have access to that um, to that Google Doc so you, you can start typing in the um, in the chat so you'll be able to see what's um, what's in there. And so you can participate with us because so we're going to have you share your ideas with us as well and see how this how this process works. And so I'm going to take you right through that. So we usually had kids they write their name the title of their book they're reading, dates, you know, they're typical teacher things that you keep up, um, help keep up with student work and they would fold those and keep them in their books. And that's how we started. So here's how this process works here. So we're gonna start with dig deeper, which is to acquaint yourself with a broad spectrum of literature genres, what cultures, traditions are work in the piece. Understand what the genre, the form of the work is. Read a variety of authors and types of writing. Uh, what do you need or want to dig deeper into? So I, I call this kind of the Google element of it because kids will read something in a book and not know what it is and just go right over it. And like, that could really be crucial to your understanding or it could deepen your appreciation for this book. And so this idea of just what, um, you know, if I'm reading young adult, I'm reading a young adult novel, so I know what to expect. I'm reading a graphic novel. These are the kind of things I can expect. Or you know, I come across something in the text I'm I'm unfamiliar with. Maybe it's a word I don't know, or it's a you know some event in history or something I'm not familiar with. And so we you got know, kids to take take a step back and say, well, let me dig a little deeper into that. So we're going to practice with that as well. We're going to look at this excerpt from Huda Fru by Huda uh, by Huda Fami. This book is hilarious. It is just delightfully funny. It is, um, but also poignant and just, you know, points. Um, uh, it's just a, a fun read. And so we're going to look at this excerpt from, um, from Who the F Are You? Oh, she's right. Afghanistan. How to, isn't it neat to be learning about your home country? Uh, not from Afghanistan. At least in middle school, I wasn't invisible. I was the hijabi. It was all I had that set me apart. And I let it become my whole personality. Now I'm not the Muslim. I'm just a Muslim. And there are hijabis everywhere. Always read the fine print. You ain't special. So if you have that document, the Google sheet there, you can go to the D, the dig deeper, or if you have, um, if you just have paper that you're gonna write on. And so looking over that excerpt from there, what's something that you would want to dig a little deeper into? Maybe you don't know much about hijabis or um, 
the Muslim faith, or maybe you want to say a little something about the format, the structure. You know, this is a graphic novel, so you know what to expect. Or it could even be, um, well, what else is Huda Fahmy uh, written? Maybe I want to look about, look at, um, Google something about the author. So this is kind of the Google moment. So I'm going to ask you to take just a few minutes or just a little, sorry, a few seconds. We're going to um, uh, spend a little time thinking about what's something that you want to dig deeper into and then um, let you write that. And then in a little bit, I'll ask you to type that into the chat. And so if you have something that you've typed into the chat, you can go ahead and put that in there now. If you haven't, we'd love to see what you dug deeper into. And I didn't give you a lot of time there, so if you're still working on it, that's okay. Something that you would dig deeper into. Um, Dearborn, why is... Why is it that she is not just um, the Muslim, but a Muslim? Why is that significant? And so if there's anything that you found that you want to type into the chat, that would be great. That one's pretty, that one's really kind of our Google moment. And again, it just so that um, students don't just um, read over something they move on to and they can help them understand the text that's better. So we're going to move on to the next one, which is opinion position. And this is, oops, sorry, I'm clicking on the wrong thing here. So more than just this, is your, what are your, your opinion or position on ideas that you're reading? Do you agree with the writer, with the actions of the characters? Um, support your thinking based on analysis of the text. This is kind of, you know, watching, this kind of reminds you of that, you know, you're watching a scary movie, a horror movie, and you're like, don't go in there or don't open that. And um, you're like, I would never do that. And so, um, so that's what we're thinking about here. Those, you know, um, the choices that the characters are making or the things that the writer is saying. Do you agree with that? Do you do you have an opinion on what's happening? So we're going to look at an excerpt here from Rising, Rising Troublemaker, a Fear Fighter, a Fear Fighter Manual for Teens by Luvi Aji Jones. And the neat thing about this is this is a nonfiction text. And so this dog ear strategy works with, with any text that um, um and I, yeah, I'm seeing the quote, the, the chat from before. Yes, thank you. Um, and so you can do the dog ears with any text that um, that you come across. So we're going to look at this excerpt from Rising Troublemaker. Folks like me, the professional troublemakers, who are committed to speaking truth to power, aren't doing it without fear. We aren't doing it because we are unafraid of consequences or sacrifices. We are We are making because of it. We are doing it because we have to. We know we must charge forward regardless. We must listen to the wisdom of Mother Maya Angelou, and that is how it's pronounced, when she said, courage is the most important of all virtues, because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. You can practice any virtue erratically, but nothing consistently without courage. For the professional troublemaker, the truth of ourselves and of the things around us, is more important than the fear that stops us from pursuing it. The things we must do are more powerful than the things we are afraid to do. Professional troublemakers recognize that fear is real and that it's an everlasting hater, but it must be tackled. So thinking about that excerpt right there, um, what's your opinion or position on the ideas that are shared in there? Jot that down in the chat or on the uh, on the sheet that you have there. But what's your opinion? Do you, do you agree with the writer here? Um, is there something from some line from there that you have an, a position or um, an opinion about, um, but take a little bit of time to read that over and then 
We'll see if we get any responses in the chat. I'll give you a little bit of time to do that. Right, and so I'm um, actually I think in, um, we have Jen in the chat who is requesting access to the Google Doc. If we can send that, and you can also type that in the chat too. So does anybody have an something, some opinion or position you have that you're thinking about what the writer, um, what the writer said here? Interesting, I'm sure I agree, charity is a virtue. Sometimes you need courage for that, but not always. Yeah, and that's great. And so again, we are engaging with um, with the writer and having our um, having our thoughts. Um, so I like that, courage is my favorite word. And so if you're not good, if you see the link, but don't have permission, um, I will send it to you. We're, I'm gonna provide all my, Contact information you can you can type in the chat with us um, for now and then we will um, we'll move on from there. But yeah, you're going to get at the end you're going to get um, a much more detailed explanation of everything we're going through. I'm kind of truncating this to keep us within the time limit and because you're adult learners, um, but you're going to get a you're going to get a detailed explanation of everything and how this came together. And so that's you know opinion and position. It's about you know do you agree with the writer? You know I'm thinking of books like. You know, they both die in the end where, um, you know, part of death cast is, you know, you get to fight, you get a call that morning that says uh, at some point in the next 24 hours, you are going to, um, you're going to die. I'm like, do you want that call? And then some of the people in the book either chose to live with reckless abandon or some, you know, stayed in and hid because they were afraid, I'm like, you know, which, you know, which would you do? And so, um, so it's about having an opinion or position about what we're, what we're reading. So we're going to move on to the next one. Let me check the chat here really quick. Okay, so that's me. So I will I will change that um, so that you can get that. My computer inexperience, you know, shining through. Um, the next one is geography. Where and when does the text unfold, and how is this significant, or is it merely background? Does it play an integral um, role in? Um, in the work. And so this is, you know, just another way of the setting. Is it thinking about where where and when the book is set and how that affects what's going on in the um, in the text? I like that idea of professional troublemaker um, as as well. Um, so we're going to look at this excerpt right here from Future Land, which probably tells you something already. Uh, Future Land, Battle for the Park. And so let's look at this excerpt here. I thought I turned those off. I'm sorry about that, you all. Um, Duly yank the covers back. Actually, at 7.25 a.m., you're five minutes and 3.25 seconds late to meet your mother, though I see that you're in need of at least another hour of sleep based on your oxygen levels and brain waves. Yeah, yeah, good morning to you too. I opened one eye, spotting her two perfectly round Afro puffs. I scowled. She smiled wide. Our grins were identical. Our skin was the same shade of bronze brown, and our faces had the same tiny star-shaped birthmark below our left eyes. Mom designed her like that, so most people would think we were family. So I wouldn't be so I wouldn't be lonely. Sometimes I forget Julie was even a rev. She fooled just about everyone. People called mom's androids the best ever made. So in that geography section, think about that, you know, where and when does this text unfold and how is that significant to the story or um, does it play an integral part? So, um, you know, would this be different if it were set in another time or place? So, um, so jot some of your thoughts down in the chat about that, what you're thinking about how, um, Yeah, I was just reading chat. Sorry, um, and I, I will change the access so you'll be able um, to get that. I thought I'd change that. So, um, but again, we can we can type in the chat, and you can see the um, you know initially we started off in paper and then eventually moved to this Google Doc, and so I will make sure that you um, that you get that. 
but thinking about the setting here, how was that, or the geography, how that plays into um, how that plays into what's happening in our text? And you can get, and if anyone wants to type that into chat, and I wish I could turn that off. I I thought I had. And sometimes you, the geography doesn't change or the setting doesn't change throughout the book. Sometimes um, it does. And it's just, it's something for students to think about and um, consider that here. Um, uh, so we got an Android book written 25 or 50 years ago. It seemed like science fiction, but they, yeah, I'm just it, kind of thinking about that. I think there was, uh, I read about a place recently where they were, um, instead of ID badges for work, they had, you know, kind of their, scanners that were kind of implanted in them so yeah some of that is um so um so different but you can see yeah so um thinking about that and then we're also knowing a little bit about just you know maybe we're even doing a little bit of um predicting thinking oh is there going to be a problem with these droids in the future um kind of what marjorie's saying they're in future with realistic droids um changes ideas and authenticity so yeah so thank you for um for sharing those so so that's your the geography we're going to move on um to the next one which is experience how do your experiences mesh or co uh, how do your personal past experience or personal experiences coincide or mesh with the experiences in the text and i have to tell you this one is um this one's kind of funny because this one is really about ideas i had this student Alyssa, who um she was reading The Fault in Our Stars by John Green at the time, and we were going over our dog ears, and she wrote an, an experience. She said, I don't have any experiences like this. I've never had cancer before. <laughs> so I'm like, Alyssa, but have you ever felt like life has treated you unfairly? Have you ever experienced something like, why me? Why did this happen to me? Have you ever felt one way about somebody and they didn't reciprocate those feelings or um, so it's really about the bigger ideas that are at work not that you've had the exact same experience and so how do your experiences how do your personal experiences coincide or mesh with those in the text and so we're going to look at another excerpt we're going to look at um, instructions for dancing by Nicola Yoon and in this story Evie is she loves her romance novels but she's kind of experienced a setback and so she's um, giving those away and she just she can't um, deal with those anymore and so we're going to look at this excerpt from um, instructions for dancing but of course I'm not the same person how could I be I wish I were as unaffected by the divorce as she and Danica are I wish I could bake with them carefree I wish I could go back to being the girl who thought her parents especially her dad could do no wrong to being the girl who hoped to have a love just like theirs when she grew up I used to believe in happily ever afters because they had one. I want to go back and unknow all the things I know now, but you can't unknow things. I can't unknow that dad cheated on mom. I can't unknow that he left us for another woman. Mom misses the version of me that used to love those books. I miss her too. So thinking about that, about the bigger ideas that are work, at work here, um, how do your experiences coincide or mesh with the text? And so it'll take just a little bit of time to think about that and then jot a response in the uh, in the chat and we'll see what uh, what we come up with together. Anybody putting their experiences or how they mesh or coincide with what's going on the text, things you're thinking about? You know, the thing about these is they can be so, um, and it's a student who was um, during our independent reading time and she's crying and I'm like, I don't do well with the crying thing. And so I, I walked up to her and I said, 
are, are you okay? Do you need to step outside? And she's like, sir, this book is so sad. And I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm like, sorry. Do you do you um, did you stop reading? She's like, no, I love it. So you know, um, so we see those students engaging with the text and and um, sharing those experiences. Thank you. Um, Marjorie, because I know there are some uh, things I wish I could unknow. Um, but again, it's that idea. What are the ideas that are at work in the text and how do our ideas, how do our experiences mesh with those? So we've got um, so we've got lots of things that we can add there. Um, moving on to our next section, and we'll come back and look at some more of these as well. Um, so we got our experience and then we have the author's actions. Looking at this screen here, um, and so we're thinking about what the um, what the author is doing with words, with sentences, with punctuation. What do you notice as you read? What reoccurs in the reading? So, um, so thinking about this is what the writer is doing as a writer. Um, what do we notice that's going on in the text? What can we? Um, what do we notice about the writing? So this is. Um, so we're going to look at an excerpt from how it all blew up. I have to tell you, I love this book so much. I'm just so happy to have this book in my life. And so um, this is by Arvan, um, Arvan uh, Amidi and uh, Amir. The character in the book is 18. He is Muslim. He is Iranian. And um, and he's gay. And he just doesn't know that he can ever come out um, to his parents. And But he's kind of being blackmailed a little bit and um, extorted um, about having that secret released to his um, um, to his parents. And so he, he um, uh, so he ends up going on a trip, going away and, and uh, his parents come and find him and bring him back home. And they get into this, they get into a big fight on the uh, on the airplane and um, shouting emotional fight on the plane. And so that creates a problem because they're Iranian and people have certain expectations or certain um, preconceptions they hold about people. And so that's going to take us to our excerpt here. As soon as we landed, Customs and Border Protection took our passports and escorted us from the plane to a holding room in the airport. Soraya, my little sister, kept asking what was going on. and My mom kept telling her to be quiet. They told us to sit and wait until our names were called. We were glued to those chairs. Soraya took out her phone and one of the officers barked at her to turn it off. Mom snatched it from her hand. After what felt like forever, one of the male officers entered the room and looked sternly at my dad. Mr. Azidi, please come with me. My dad didn't ask any questions. He just went. Then a minute later, I got pulled into this room. Was I in touch with any organizations while I was in Rome? Oh, God, you must think I ran away to join ISIS, don't you? You probably think they recruited me to their Italian satellite office. Sir, I don't mean to belittle the evils of the world, but those guys would never take a fruit like me. I'm sorry we scared all those people on the plane. I really am. I wish I hadn't exploded at my parents like that, all spit and tears and hysteria on an airplane, especially being, you know, of a certain complexion. But at the end of the day, I'd much rather be in the airport interrogation room than back in the closet. You asked me why we were fighting, sir. And to answer that question, I'll have to start at the beginning. So if you'll take just a little bit to look over that excerpt from, uh, from how it all blew up. And what are you noticing that the author is doing with words, with sentences or punctuation? Um, any things that you notice the writer doing as a writer as you as you read. So think about that and then I'll give you a little time to look over that. And then if you can share some things that you notice in the uh, in the chat. Yes, yeah, so I love those verbs, the um, glued, snatched, and bark, and I just, I, I felt that um, uh, right away. Um, anything else we're noticing about what the author is doing as, a, as the author, the writer as the writer here?
think one of the things that, and I've that that I noticed right away is just even the title of the book, um, because here it is on a plane and what people um, what people believe about people of a certain um, certain complexion on the plane and how it's called how it all blew up and then how we use the verb exploded at my parents and people are assuming that those are kind of um, this kind of people and that's what they do on planes and so I, I just I really liked um, that uh, how the how the author did that. You know, the other thing that happens here is this is a place where students often ask questions. I typed this exactly as it was in the book, the um, the Ital uh, the text in italics. And so, and that may be a question that, that a student writes in their author's action. I noticed that he's writing in italics. I don't know, is that because he's thinking this or because it's a, a flashback? And you can kind of also see, you know, we've got kind of a non-linear story here because I have to start at the beginning. Um, yeah, that um the per the point of view that heightens that immediacy so yeah so we're paying attention here to what the author's actions are what what the writer is doing as a writer here so um beautiful piece i just, I, I just love this book so much um, so we're going to move on to our next one which is reflection um more than whether you like it or not um Discuss the hows and whys. Be specific. What do you wonder? And this is kind of just a, you know, we're reading here. And what is it making me think? Um, wh what do I wonder about? Do Why do I like this? Why do I not like this? What, what you know, what about this part? And so it's just kind of, you know, thinking, um, thinking about our reading and thinking about our thinking as we're reading. So we're going to look at this excerpt from Painter States of Nothing, which I have to tell you, what this this was my, the year this came out, this was my favorite book of the year. And this was the book that I was recommending to everyone all the time. It was just so, so beautiful and so powerful and so moving. So I absolutely love the book. I still recommend it to people. And so, um, uh, so you have our character who is um, senior in high school and just, you know, content to play, you know, video games and, and you know, go on to college the next year. Um, but he'd you know been pen palling with his with his young his cousin as a as a young child his cousin in the Philippines and um, then he hears that his cousin is um, murdered as a part of um, Duterte's you know crackdown on drugs and nobody in the family wants to talk about it and he has so many questions and so he ends up going to to the Philippines to visit and to find out what was going on and puts himself in really some dangerous situations so let's look at this excerpt from patron saints of nothing. She must be careful, Professor Santos says, looking around as if to check for anyone who might be listening. Those who are in power do not like the truth to be known if it does not make them look good. During the Marcos regime, hundreds of journalists and other critics of the administration disappeared into thin air. Right now, any investigation involving the drug war that seeks to tell a story other than how effective it is, is dangerous. One of my colleagues wrote such a piece. Then he wrote another, and then he was arrested on some tax-related charges I'm certain were fabricated. Think that is some coincidence? And surprise the government lets those stories be published at all, I say. They can't do much about the foreign pieces except dismiss them as sensationalism. As for the domestic reporting, they can't do anything directly because we have freedom of the press, he says. But don't think for a moment that they don't keep track of every single person who criticizes them, that they don't find ways to apply pressure on these individuals when it suits them. He pauses to let his words sink in. Mia nods. Then he turns to me. So, Jay, are you a journalism student back in America? I shake my head. High school senior. This is a matter of personal interest. He considers this. Most people are content to let things be. With all the digging Mia has told me you've been doing into what has happened to your cousin, perhaps you're meant to be one of us. The first sign of a good reporter is an unhealthy obsession with the truth. So thinking about that, as you reflect on that, what you know, what do you wonder? What are you thinking about? Um, do you like what, what's going on there? Why do you like it? What um, maybe your perceptions have been different? But uh, so um, take a little bit of time to think uh, to reflect on this, and then if you can share in the chat with us what you um, what you're reflecting upon.
And once you have anything, feel free to drop that into, into the chat. You know, one of the things that I was wondering about as I reread this piece and, and and probably why I liked it from the beginning too, because I was, you know, wondering why we tend to just kind of lump all media and journalism into the same kind of bucket and think, you know, so negatively about them on you know, you know, people who put their lives at risk to um tell the world what's going on. And so um so it makes me kind of wonder why um you know why we kind of lump everybody into that same um, uh, into that same category, and I, I wonder if I would have been as curious as um, to go and find out a story. What's going on in a story like this? Um, any other reflections? Anyone cares to share with us? This takes place in another country. It gives America readers safe space to examine. Like, yeah, that's um, yeah. I like. I really like the thinking there. Um, and it, you know, it seems you know as we you know um, perspectives and and depending on what people's you know biases are. Yeah, we can we can have all kinds of um, uh, all kinds of misperceptions as well too. And it, but yeah, I like that idea of you know a, a safe place to to process that. Um, this is an absolutely beautiful book, and and again, I just I, I love it so much. And if you um, if you haven't read it, I I would just recommend that you that you get this one. I think um, students will really um, like that. Any other reflections before we move on? Okay, so that is reflection. We are going to move on to show understanding. And this is about telling things your own words and and, um, and being able to state things your own words shows that you understand. Words can mean more than their literal definitions. What feelings and tones do the words convey? Or what do you understand? What do you know or understand better after reading this? And so this can this is kind of a little bit of a uh, can be a little bit of a catch all for students. It can be a place to summarize. Um, it can be a place to think about um, how the words are being used, but also, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about something differently now. I understand things a little, um, a little better after, um, um, after reading this. And so we're going to look at this excerpt from uh, Project F. And this is a middle grade novel. It is set in the future, and um, there are, there are no smartphones, no cars, um, no televisions. Uh, climate change has kind of wreaked havoc on earth. And so people are now living a more, a much more simple life. Um, so thinking about this, let's look at this excerpt from here. Margaret Arlo, Keith's mother, opened the letter and read, Dear Mr. and Mrs. Arlo, we are very sorry to inform you. Her face went pale and she read on without speaking. She handed the letter to Keith's father, whose name was Arthur. He took the letter, scanned it, and said, oh, no. What is it, Keith asked. His father handed him the letter, and he read it quickly. Unfortunately, it said, being unfamiliar with ocean tides and currents, did not notice a sudden large wave. Husband went into rescue. Both were swept away. Swept away, Keith said. Does it mean they drown? It would seem so, his father said. Alice and Dennis both. Keith's mother leaned against the wall, her hands at the sides of her face, and she stared at the air. Alice was her sister. Dennis was Alice's husband. Keith read on. As nearest relatives, you'll be responsible for the child left on the beach, currently in the care of Sandwater Children's Home. I can't understand this, said Keith's mother. The child, he said, that, that would be Lulu. When I skipped ahead to the next page, said Keith said right away, I'll go. His mother said, Keith, a thousand misfortunes can happen on a two-day trip, especially to someone like you. Four-day trip, said Keith, two days each way. 
Persis but said his mother, I'd be on the train in a minute if I hadn't missed that step. His father simply said, it's a big responsibility. Keith reminded them that he was smart, capable, strong, and almost 14 years old, though his birthday was not far for, was not for another eight months. So thinking about that, um, you can um, summarize what's going on there or um, think about what you might understand differently after reading this or some other thoughts. It's uh, lots of things can go on here. So I'll give you just a little bit of time to, to think about this passage here and jot something in the chat. Yeah, that's uh, you know the uh, someone like you. That's a, that's an interesting question. I might even want to you know understand. Um, uh, you know, I think one of the things that I understand is that it feels like children were different ages at different times. You know, thirteen seems like such a child now, but you know, a hundred years ago, you know, thirteen, you were working to help support your family and those kind of things, and many kids are still doing that. So, um, so yeah, so that is um, that's the. Summarize, you can help kids, you know, something from the beginning, middle, and end. Um, and so that's how that all works. But probably one of the things that you've noticed along the way is that from all these different excerpts that we've looked at, you can really fit them in lots of different places. Um, and so we're going to do a little practice with that. I'm going to give you um, two more excerpts. We are real quick. And um, because I love this book so much, there's this excerpt from... Uh, from how it all blew up. And then because um, this is another, uh, this is Huda F. Cares, which is a different graphic novel, but also by Huda Fami. And in this excerpt, the family is going on vacation to Disney. And so if you'll take just a, um, pick one of those to read and then pick one of the dog ears that you want to do. Maybe you want to dig deeper into something. Maybe you have an opinion or position on one of these. Maybe you have an experience that um, coincides with the text or you see the author doing something but read over those really quick and then just and pick one and um and then jot down in the chat which um, um if you'll put the letter in front of it you're doing the d or the o or the g and um and tell us what you're um what you're thinking from the selection that you picked Sorry. You may have that experience of traveling with your siblings on a long car ride on vacation. I was uh, thinking about that. Um, And probably as you want to, you know, you'll find that your your students will get to know these really well. Um, we're kind of, you know, walking through them. And so it's not as easy for us to um, jot those things down. But they really, this became the core instructional part of, of, of my teaching. It And we did so many things with this. I could, um, you know, students got this on Monday and, you know, could turn them in on Friday. And so, and because teachers, you know, like, I have two grades a week or three grades a week. And so this gave me something that I could um, connect with my students. It also became part of our reading conferences. I could go through these dog ears with them as we were doing reading conferences with them. Um, we extended this in lots of different ways. And so I wanted to show you a couple of things that we, um, we even took this into, we did um, drawing dog ears where kids use the dog ears and they um, kind of brought their art to that. Um, different ways to look at that. Kids really will amaze you with what um, what they can do and kind of bring that higher order thinking in as well because they're creating the images and the words and putting those um, those ideas together. Um, 
we could do this with, you know, if I gave out an essay or an article from class, I could choose the things that I wanted them to do the dog ears on. Here, read this article on this topic. And now here's something I want you to dig deeper into. Here's this specific line from the passage. What's your opinion or position on that? I can ask them how the, um, where and when the story takes place and how that was significant. So I could guide them through that. I could also give them another article to read or another piece of reading and then um, their annotations were the dog ears. What, what do you need to dig deeper into? What opinion or position do you have? What experience do you have that messes with this? So it fit into everything that we did. Additionally, these then grew into our writing as well. The D was our, um, the Google section then became our research. What could you research from this reading that you were already engaged in because you chose this book? And so your research topic could come from that. The O, P, the opinion position, you've got your um, argument or your persuasive writing that can grow from the book that you read. The geography, the show understanding and the author's actions is the literary analysis portion of that. And so we can look into that. And then the reflection and the experience, those became our personal narratives, our memoir writing. So everything, when I talk about how it became the core of my instructional day, that's really what it was. Everything that we did grew out of this strategy. We could add it with everything else. Um, I recently shared it with a friend of mine who um, went from administration to teaching, and uh, he sent me this text message just a few, um, just a couple of weeks ago. Kids are settling into independent reading, and I did group projects on the books we were reading as a class. And I'm hearing dog ears in their presentations. It's awesome. I model my independent reading for them all the time, verbally, and I share my logs with them. Dog ears has made me a better reader too. And then kind of the rest is just you know for him and me, but. Um, and then I shared it with another friend of mine who works as an um, in a region service center here, working with teachers and instruction. And um, one of the messages she sent me is, I'm loving dog ears and other content areas. Social studies is always a natural fit, but really liking the connection with biology. And so you see when I tell you, you can work with any um, piece of text that you are reading and um, and kids internalize it and they get so good at it. They they know what to do. And it's not taking away from the enjoyment of the reading because they're still choosing to read. But then there's also this the ability to talk about what it is they're reading. Um, when I was working on my first uh, my first young adult novel um, that my agent is out pushing now, and hopefully some of you will be able to read it one of these days. But I, I, there was, I was doing some research and I reached out to one of my students, um, former students, and I said, I need a little help with something. And then can I can I pick your brain and ask you some questions? And and uh, I love this response that I got back from him. Mr. Gavon, I didn't even know you were writing a book. That's awesome. It's the least I could do after all your help these past years. And I would have needed some other author to believe that your writing was good. Ha ha, I better get excited or I'll have my lawyer contact you. Seriously can't express how much I appreciate you and all your help. I'm excited to read this book when it comes out too. I'll be sure to send you a dog ears of it. And I just, I, I love that. It was um Again, and I will tell you, and I, he's a character in this book. I, there's one little scene, and I just, I think I flat out named him Mondo Rodriguez. And the young lady who stopped me, uh, who said, you know, was crying over the book, and I love this book. Uh, I had her when she was a sophomore, and I saw her senior year. She stopped me in the hall, and she said, sir, I started reading this book in your class, and I didn't get to finish it. I found it in the library, and I finished reading it, and I loved it so much. And so, um, so it's really about engaging kids and helping them become lifelong readers, um, you will get all of them. This is all this is my next book that my agent is working on, and hopefully you'll read this soon too. You have all my contact information there. I'm going to stop sharing here so that if anybody has any questions and um, or anything that you want to ask, I'm happy to um, answer that. You can either type in the chat or um, I don't know if Ashley, if they can unmute and we can talk, but I'm, I'm happy to um to share any of this with you. So yeah, so kids, their, their kids were often reading. Um, and so what was really interesting is we did a lot of collaboration because um, as, as kids got through this, they'd be at their table and they're like, and, and some would say, well, is that is that experience or is that reflection? And, and and you know it really didn't matter. And some people and some like is that? And they would put it in different categories. And I'm like, why? Well, I, I think that's this. And it, yeah. And so they they were able they were able to do that. Um, it just you know it gave us um, 
talking points with their books. And then again, that's how I did my um, reading conferences with them. So, so yeah, they, they, they were allowed to um, collaborate and lots of kids saw things differently as well. So yes, thank you. This turned out to be a lot of kids recommended books this way too. Um, when somebody would finish a book, they'd say, oh, read such and such because they were so engaged in these books that they were reading. And it was just, I mean, literally kids, would, I, some kids would stop me at the doors they're coming in because they were upset over something that happened um, in their um, in their book. And so uh, it just, uh, and again, the pictures from earlier in the slideshow, those those were kids reading real kids, reading real books. And uh, um, I will tell you, you know, we, we didn't just start this. It didn't just, you know, happen and, um, you know, kind of had to create that culture. And you can email me and I'm happy to tell you how we did that. But we we um, we walked through um, a lot of that um, and, and built up to that. The other thing I will say is you need books. You just have to have books. And I um, I don't this is me a little bit on my soapbox here, but I don't believe teachers should be spending their weekends at garage sales and in half price books, trying to find classroom library books. I believe the onus is on school districts and schools and campus leadership to provide books for classroom libraries. And you know what, if a book gets lost or destroyed or a kid keeps it, so what? Replace it because we want kids having lifelong experiences with books. And the way they do that is by engaging with books that they love to read. So, so get them those books. I'm seeing this book in the background right here, um, barely missing everything. I, I had a teacher reach out to me because I gave him that book. He's like, do you have any more copies of that book? My kids are fighting over it. So, um, and so that's what I did. And so this, and again, it became a part of everything I did in my classroom. Kids are reading books, loving books, crying over books, arguing over books. It was just, you know, and it just, it, and then my kids did great on all those standardized assessments that people expected because they were becoming better readers because they were reading things that they wanted to read. So it just, you know, it, it served every purpose. And I will tell you, I was in a, at a low socioeconomic school. So it, it um, you go back to the, the research from Stephen Crash, and he said more than any instructional approach, um, regardless of socioeconomic status, independent free choice reading, that's what, that makes the difference. So thank you all for being here this evening with us. I, you're going to get copies of all of this. You've got my contact information there. I, I will share anything with anyone. If you want me to, I'll come out and do this at your school or whatever, you know, so um, um, I, I just love sharing. So thank you again for spending this time with us. I know it's a busy time of year. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Ashley and wrap things up and thank you again. Thank you, Michael, for offering your time and insights tonight. And I also want to say thank you to Penguin Random House for contributing. Yes, the thank you. Mentioned. Um, as a reminder, you will receive an email with the webinar recording, uh, the slide deck, and uh, additional resources tomorrow. We'll make sure you have uh, access to that link um, and the dog ears uh, that uh, Michael walked through. Um, to stay up to date on great ELA resources and other webinars like this, please subscribe to our Next Step blog. It is nextstep.perfectionlearning.com. Uh, there you'll find other webinars like this um, and great lessons from Michael as well. Um, and please also follow Perfection Learning on all our social media accounts so you never miss a post and so you can stay up to date on future webinars. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining and have a great evening.